Hi there. I'm going to beg your uh, indulgence. I'm going to read my talk today. I will try to read slowly. And uh, it, I trust this will keep me from repeating myself and, and getting off on tangents and, and that sort of a thing. So, um, um, yes, let's begin. I am as excited about finding out what is going on at Trinity as I am about telling you a little bit about what's going on with me. I anticipate that I will confirm that already there is much overlap between the two. Complementary ideas are perhaps swimming in a primordial soup, waiting only for this conversation to trigger their coalescence into something even more advanced than what either of us currently grasps. Let me express my gratitude to you for this invitation. I'm so glad also for the interface between classroom and congregation, teachers and pastors represented in this lecture venue. My passion and comfort level is always to talk to ordinary people in a manner that the professionals also find expert. Additionally, the professionals are themselves also ordinary people. So again, thank you for this opportunity. I am a one-trick horse. If it's Esther talking, we're talking about knowing. My goal is to help you forward in your understanding of, appreciation for, and excellence in the knowing you always do. Perhaps we can start our later roundtable discussion by having you take a couple quiet minutes to survey your everyday involvements and identify the reams of epistemic acts interwoven through the total fabric of your life. Knowing isn't more than one step removed from living. It is a key piece in, of a piece with, engaging the world to which we are called and for which we are hardwired, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. The hardwire word was mine. It's not in the, in the passage. <laughs> Indeed, I feel that a healthy vision regarding knowing simultaneously offers solid guidance for abundant living. So this first section is called Knowing as Information, the Defective Epistemic Default. Perhaps you have never thought of your mother's milk as epistemic. But if you are like me, you have come into the world with some assumptions about what knowledge is, assumptions many people have never even identified, assumptions which nevertheless operate powerfully. I am given to colorful picture language. I call this our subcutaneous epistemic layer, alternatively, our default mode. I guess it depends on whether you see yourself as a person or a computer. Whatever it is, it's diseased. I see myself as being in the business of epistemological therapy. I want to help people identify this layer, diagnose it as defective, and point them in the direction of its healing. So we'll do the first two of these simultaneously. Finding our subcutaneous epistemic layer, our default mode, and starting to see that it is sick. What many people presume or assume that knowledge is, what knowledge is like is information. Knowledge is information or statements and proofs. Knowledge is accurate, justified statements. If it isn't explicitly articulated in statements, it isn't knowledge. Many people also think that knowledge, to be knowledge, must be allied with certain things and distinguished from others. So, and I call this Esther's daisy of dichotomies, I warned you. Now I'm about to name several pairs, and if you want to draw a picture or see it in your mind, see it as a daisy and put the first of the pair in the center and the second of the pair out on a petal, okay? So here we go. 
this is what I'm saying. Many people in their default settings tend to think uh, how they ally knowledge. So the first is knowledge as over against belief. Another one is fact as over against opinion. Another is fact as over against value. See how this is working? Reason as over against emotion. Reason as over against faith. Science as over against art. Theory as over against application. Mind as over against body. And possibly male as over against female. The default presumption is that knowledge, fact, reason, mind, and science, and possibly male, coincide. The petals may or may not coincide. Sometimes we're inclined to think they do. Is religion female? Is art female? Is emotion female? And notice what knowledge is not. Value, emotion, art, body. One is always surprised to find a scholarly football player, for example. Female, nor faith. Not everybody thinks like this, nor does anyone think like this all the time, but I trust that you would grant that it is common enough. And, and this is my point, it operates as a default setting even before we have figured out what a default is or that it is functioning as the default. And also my point, people have presumptive opinions about what knowledge is and what it isn't that are bound to affect all the knowing that they go about. One of these binary pairs particularly affects believers and I would think pastors. It is reason and faith. Consider the following. Many people have felt the tension between doctrinal or theological propositions as over against a personal relationship with Christ. We know the latter is our soul's only hope for salvation, so why study theology? And our relationship with Christ must not be knowledge, it's faith. Um, seminaries are jokingly referred to as cemeteries, okay? You go there and you lose your faith. Um, how do Christians view scripture? As reason or faith? Neither should feel like a fit, yet it can be thought that these are the only two options. How do unbelievers view a gospel presentation? It is common for them to hear it also as a call to check their brains or their reason at the door in order to become a Christian. And some well-meaning Christians have concurred. On the other hand, some well-meaning Christians have presented the gospel as all about rational argumentation, and that doesn't seem quite right either. I hope you're feeling the problem. What results from such a default setting? 18-year-olds who show up in freshman classes believing that getting an education involves passively receiving immediately lucid information that is then going to be on the test. People in the pew who think that discipleship is about Bible studies and sermons full of deep theological propositions, first theory and then application, people who love Jesus but have never been guided to go epistemic on that personal relationship. A world full of unbelievers who, as Leslie Newbigin has so powerfully argued, cannot even hear the gospel without someone first unclogging their ears of this epistemic wax. Unbelievers who marginalize the religious as non-rational and non-knowledge. Not to mention people on their jobs 
who are not permitted to count as knowledge and leverage their own powers for knowingly engaging the world. I think of innovation in corporate engineering, for example. A serial innovator, as defined by Bruce Bojack, head of engineering at University of Illinois, is an engineer who with some frequency comes up with innovative ideas which are buildable, marketable, and valuable. A serial innovator, Vojak argues, cannot possibly be trained and developed on the assumption that such ideas can be reached either linearly or randomly. Yet, Corporations and engineers can be thwarted in their professional efforts by their misimpression that coming to know involves either a systematic, linear, rational sequence or a random, irrational, who knows what. My point here is that epistemological therapy can help everything from Christian discipleship to engineering and actually to your golf game. So, this paper's proposal is covenant epistemology. Now to my proposal and a very brief sketch of what I plan to tell you. I propose that we embrace a fresh understanding of what knowing is. I want to propose that we take as our paradigm of all knowing the interpersonal, covenantally constituted relationship. This thesis is what I have decided to call covenant epistemology and that which I have been working to develop. The title of this talk has more than one thing going on in it, knowing, knowing, knowing God. I mean to say that if you are better at knowing, you will be better at knowing God. I also mean to say that knowing God is paradigmatic for all knowing. Currently, in draft form, the anticipated book is called Contours of Covenant Epistemology, Conversations on the Way to Knowing. So this is a sketch of the contours. So that you can start to work with this epistemic vision, I want to tell you very briefly about each of the following. The first is its mechanism, which you will be familiar with if you have read Longing to Know, which I will assume for this talk. Michael Polanyi's subsidiary focal integration and the idea that knowing is not information so much as transformation. Second, the idea of covenant as unfolding personal relationship. Third, how interpersonal covenant relationship contexts, cores, studs, and enlivens human knowing. Fourth, what all that looks like and entails for our high calling to invite the real, to know for shalom, and to be semper transformanda, to be able to cultivate those previously discredited, not even noticed dimensions of knowing and being known that anchor all human knowing and make it a form of the implicit love of God. This is a tall order but I hope you will invite me back again. All right, so now this next section is called Knowing is Subsidiary Focal Integration. I'm sorry, Subsidiary Focal Integrative Transformation. And um, this is the Polani part. Thank you. So uh, it's perhaps the toughest going as far as listening to this being read, but it's also the part that's in longing to know. So um, uh, I hope that's okay. And after this, I think uh, this talk gets a little bit easier. In all our knowing, Polanyi said, we subsidiarily rely on and attend from clues actively struggling to integrate to a focal pattern that we submit to as a token of reality. This from to subsidiary focal relationship makes for acts of coming to know being something other than linear sequences and it characterizes all our continuing epistemic commitments, the things that we continue to hold true. To give a brief example, take learning to read. Once you get it, it applies to absolutely everything in life. 
But let's start with taking learning to read. First, you start to attend to marks inscribed on a page. It could be like remembering when you first learned or uh, the last time you learned a, a language. Let's say you're trying to learn Chinese. Then someone guides you to identify them, name them, and associate sounds with them. But there comes this moment when your active struggle toward a state of affairs you have only anticipated undergoes transformation. Some kind of shift occurs, and you are able to look from the page rather than at the page as you start to make sense of those marks. They are transformed. You are reading, and you are transformed. You have become a reader. You never ever leave the page behind, no matter how good a reader you become. If I wrest the book from your grasp, whatever castles and kingdoms and worlds you may have been unfolding, the whole reading process comes crashing to a halt. To begin to read and to continue to read then, you rely on clues to integrate to a meaningful focal pattern. Here are one or two things that are implied by this. What knowing is based on, based on, that's a word picture, but nevertheless, is clues you can't put into words at the same time that you are attending from them. There's actually more clues than you can name, and they get their meaning not in themselves, but rather as they bear on the focal pattern. Knowing starts from something other than data, or factoids that are either certain or meaningless. It starts from bodily indwelled, more than articulable features that we have nevertheless taken a risk to cast ourselves onto the surge of. We know from our interpreted bodies and worlds. These things are properly employed when they are functioning as subsidiaries. We actively integrate from subsidiary clues to a focal pattern that we then submit to as a token of reality. On the other end of the act of coming to know, we find a situation no more exhaustively lucid or certain than were the subsidiary clues. For all that, just as indeterminate clues were as such more embodied and palpable, as a result of, as, of being indeterminate and uh, inarticulable, a discovery is more real and, may I suggest, more person-like than we were anticipating. Our half-blind groping for a way forward has been met, it seems, by one who graciously opens the door and walks in and takes over. We know we have made contact with reality when we have the sense of the possibility of indeterminate future manifestations. That's what Polanyi always said, and this is what tantalized me into doing a dissertation actually on this sentence. I'll say it again. We know we have made contact with reality when we have a sense of the possibility of indeterminate or unspecifiable future manifestations. It is not two-dimensional certainties that greet us, transform us, delight us, assure us, tantalize and dance us out into the unknown. It is a very three-dimensional, half-hidden, graciously self-disclosing real. For those familiar with the terms, I am affirming all this as over against epistemic foundationalism, epistemic constructivism, epistemic relativism, and epistemic naturalism. What subsidiary focal integration implies is an epistemic situation more akin than any of these to a biblical view of creation and humans as creatures. Polanyi's insights actually help us make reasonable sense of creaturely knowing. That is all I can take time to say about subsidiary focal integration, except that pondering over the years on this signature feature of the real, 
is what first pointed me in the direction of casting the known as person-like and the knowing as covenantally, relationally, interpersonal. Then, in the wake of study of James Loder's incredible book, The Transforming Moment, I have followed his lead in amplifying the subsidiary focal integrative act by calling it the knowing event and transformation. A sizable portion of the clues integrated into the pattern are me. Thus, since integration transforms the clues, integration transforms me. So you can take a breath. That's the end of the subsidiary focal integration part. My reading uh, sp speed is okay with me? Okay, don't go to sleep. I tell my students, you know, Aristotle was the peripatetic philosopher. So if you need to pace to stay awake, you're welcome to. Just go back there. Just like walk back and forth. It's totally okay. So it is like three in the afternoon and warm and, you know, nap time. Okay, knowing is covenantally dimensioned. This is the next section. As I continued to mull over the experience of knowing or seeking to know, I saw that the one who longs to know binds her or himself in a covenantal fashion, not ever with the presumption of wresting information from a brutish universe, but with love, humility, patience, and commitment to what is the as yet undiscovered reality. This is what we are doing when we invest hours and dollars to learn a skill, to probe a problem, or understand a person. I saw that the epistemic suitor has to start to live life on the terms of the reality he or she doesn't yet, but longs to know. Through my teaching partnership and friendship with Mike Williams, biblical theologian at Covenant Seminary, I came to appropriate his understanding of the idea of covenant implied in scripture. We both sensed its affinity to knowing on a Polanian construal, as well as the implications of that affinity for offering an account of human knowing that accords with the lordship of God alone, that is, creaturely knowing. Covenant is first and foremost a relationship of mutuality involving initiative and response constituted by promises and obligations, one that unfolds over time to the end of ongoing friendship and communion. I'll read that again. Covenant is first and foremost a relationship of mutuality involving initiative and response constituted by promises and obligations, one that unfolds over time to the end of ongoing friendship or communion. Mike and I used to teach uh, epistemology together at uh, Covenant, and then um, I revised for publication his wonderful book, Far as the Curse is Found. Um, and so that kind of became the theology of my soul as I, I did that work. So uh, I commend that book to you. But you can utter such a grand sentence as this last one about such a grand thing as covenant, and there can be no body in it at all. No persons appear in that sentence. In fact, in our Reformed tradition, we have thought more about the dead in it, the bond and blood, for example, than about living people in living relationship. Our Western philosophical tradition inclines us inexorably to abstract concepts. The covenant, we say, forgetting the most important part, the people connected covenantally. So the next section is called knowing is interpersonal. This calls for additional therapy. Once I saw my own need, I turned to the work of John McMurray, Scottish philosopher of religion, whose mid-20th century Gifford lectures are published in two volumes. The second one is called Persons in Relation. Also, to the early 20th century work of Martin Buber, I and Thou, to James Loder, whom I've already mentioned, 
and to the work of Trinitarian theologians, specifically Colin Gunton, in his The One, the Three, and the Many. And by the way, all of these become chapters in Contours. Uh, they're the conversations that I have. All of these people put forth the following critical and profound insights as what should be obvious if we just look. Before we ever get to talking about knowing, to be a person is fundamentally not to be a substance attribute stacked rational animal. It is to be a being in communion, a person in communion. To have a person, there must be at least two people. Now that insight alone is worth the price of your admission today and should keep you intrigued at least until the next Henry Center lecture. But don't leave. When Aristotle laid out, now I'm going to talk about Aristotle Hill here, when he laid out essential and accidental qualities way back at the dawn of Western philosophy, he deemed a thing or a substance relations to be not essential, but rather accidental to it. The personalists, as I may so designate this group of thinkers that I'm talking about, are saying that this is an egregious error. Relation, interpersonal relation, lies at the very core of what it means to be a person. An infant is born into interpersonal relationship. If you are sitting here today, it's because some person caught you in their arms when you came out the chute, held you and fed you eight inches or so from their face. You thought it was the milk that was your life. Guess what? It was the face. Your first controlled action was personal. You smiled. Rational animals do not smile in response to faces full of love. Persons do. By the way, is such a situation covenantal? Absolutely. The caregivers bind themselves to your needs, faithfully serving even between the smiles. And we won't mention all the things that go on between the smiles. The personalists aver that knowing, along with being, is contexted from the get-go by the interpersonal relationship, and that knowing is itself primordially knowledge of the personal other. The first knowing is knowing the personal other. Knowing and being known thus go hand in hand. 1 Corinthians 13 promises that we will do both fully in glory. But we should not infer the false implication that we do not do both now in part. Being known personally makes me me and makes me a better knower. It should be evident that the parent-child relationship is prototypical. We could say, use words like proximal or primitive also. It is that which shapes us to long for the face that will not go away. Scripture makes it evident that God's face, God's love, covenanted me into existence, sustains every atom of me through every millisecond. I exist in his gaze. You could say that the plan is for me to see the smile on his face and learn to smile back. To process this, you need to stop and imagine yourself face to face with a human being whom you love comfortably and deeply enough to gaze into their face. I have for years used a term I coined actually for my students to suggest that they develop a category other than going out that male and female friends can do. The term is starbucking. I found, myself asked, I found myself asked to go starbucking, and so I have with my students. But imagine yourself starbucking. The point is this, face-to-face -face interpersonal communion is fundamentally a different sort of knowing from knowledge as information, and it is as good as it gets. And I hope you can see that when we talk of covenant relationship, 
persons in face-to-face -face communion is what we should envision. It makes it way easier to see and sense how the covenant is the very love we need to live. People my age may well be familiar with Buber's famous distinction of I it and I thou. These pairs signify two different modes of existence, he says, or manners of relating to something. Informational knowledge, as you may guess, is I it. It is third person where the I is a subjective experience and the it is an object. I, you, is not experience so much as encounter. It is second person, the kind of communion that pertains when both parties are saying you to the other. I, you, encounters formatively shape and constitute us as better persons and better knowers. Buber says that the I is a shibboleth, you can tell whether someone's I is I it or I you. He laments that I it engagements have a way of encroaching and choking us out like so many weeds. Buber argues, however, that I you encounters are not meant to be sustained indefinitely, but rather to stud, and that's my word, our lives. I'm thinking, you know, how diamonds would stud a, a shawl or a tiara or, or something like that, okay? So stud, so think diamonds. <laughs> Shaping us into the I of I you, a quality we then carry about us and bring even to all our I it engagements. We are to take the I of I you into all our I its. This is what inspires my remixed phrase, Semper Transformanda. Once we have been known or transformed, we become transformers. Trinitarian theologians are also personalists. Gunton, along with John Zizulis, posit, or posits that to be is to be in communion. They argue that this, rather than the old substantival anthropology, accords with and makes better sense of the doctrine of the Trinity. Drawing on the Cappadocian Fathers, they argue that the interpersonal communion of the persons of the Trinity is perichoretic, meaning dance-like. Perichoresis aptly pictures a dynamic rather than a static constancy, faithful, mutual, rhythmical overture and response. Relationality is critical but equally so is particularity. Better than starbucking then as a picture is dance. We gaze and move apart and in again in a relationship of mutual promises and obligations that unfolds in time, embodied and enhanced in our particularity to the end of communion. Dance is covenantal through and through. You gotta trust your partner or the dance ain't no good. I confess uh, I am a, a Dancing with the Stars devotee, but I noticed in the, in the last two weeks of the new season that the judges said to one couple, you need to, to the, 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 uh, the contestant female, you need to rely on and trust your partner, they said to the one couple. To another couple, they said, you need to be a dancer in yourself. So one emphasized relationality and the other emphasized particularity, and the point is they've got to be balanced. So um, lessons from Dancing with the Stars. Okay, great philosophical lessons from Dancing with the Stars. Okay, next section then. Knowing and being known by God is the paradigm and central core of human knowing. It is James Loder who provides the way to link all this to God on the one hand and to everyday human knowing on the other in one fell swoop. Having traced Polanyi's account of knowing in his own account of knowing as transformation, he then explores the source of the dynamism that drives the human struggle to know, 
Whence this care and passion and longing and love that cores the act of coming to know? Why do we long to know? Loder argues that the dynamism of knowing is rooted in the dynamics of being human. Four dimensions of humanness must develop. Dimensions one and two are roughly the lived world and the self that lives it. These are good and necessary dimensions of humanness, and you might think of them uh, scripturally as situated stewardship. Sadly, many human goals and psychological analyses deem this two-dimensionality, if that's all there is to uh, uh, humanness, to be normal. Think of high school commencement addresses that still look forward to success, typically defined as a good job, a family, and a house. And again, there's nothing wrong with these two dimensions unless you say that this is all there is to humanness. And if, if we define uh, humanness in terms of coping with an environment, okay, successfully coping with an environment, that's two-dimensional. But there is a third and a fourth dimension to being human, he says, ones that apparently lie outside our own capacity to inaugurate or control. The third loader terms the void. The void is any experience of the threat or reality of not being. Often we cling to two-dimensionality to keep us from having our faces rubbed in the void, but inevitably we face the void. For example, suppose you have been aspiring to your high school comm commencement's definition of success. Midlife crisis is about the void. Young people today get it sooner. It's called quarter life crisis. The agonizing crises of life, a car accident, an economic downturn, disease, divorce, and so on, expose us to the void. However, I personally believe that such evils only seem necessary to our experience of the void because we, in our sin-induced bentness, forget our existential contingency, our metaphysical dependence, our inherent fragility, the fact that we are not ourselves God, but depend on him in every atom, in every millisecond. And I think you gotta get that's kind of, getting that is, is essential to worship. He's God, I'm not. And, and every, every atom, every breath, is from him, okay? So it's, it's our sin that means that sometimes we, we forget that and, and then in God's sovereign purposes, sometimes it takes evil to wake us up to that. Isn't it intriguing that Loder deems the void as the third dimension of the four dimensions of humanness? It is essential to being human. In our futile attempts to deny the void, we have been keeping ourselves from being human. <laughs> and what is the fourth dimension? It is the holy, the gracious possibility of new being. It is a deliverance that comes only from outside of us and to us only when we are in the void. Now, just because you're in the void doesn't guarantee, okay, so this is necessary, not sufficient. Um, the, the holy, uh, I'll just continue here, the holy is the other that graciously seeks our flourishing and constitutively recenters us in this other himself, even as it restores us to our world. It is the personal other, the face that will not go away. Again, with dimension four, I find it astounding and humbling and cause for worship that my full human personhood requires two dimensions that lie beyond my own capacity to fabricate, and one of them is a redeeming, delivering, sustaining, holy person. Loder argues that the dynamics of this unfolding four-dimensionality of humanness operate in every act 
of coming to know. An act of coming to know is inaugurated when the knower's self-world two-dimensional complacency is ruptured by the void and the knower faces nothing. Loder calls this conflict in context. For Polanyi, it was the, the uh, realization of a problem in, a, in the context of scientific research. We are driven to struggle deeply on the verges of a threatening abyss of nothingness toward the epistemic deliverance of insight. We long to know. When it comes, it is thoroughly an act of grace of the other, even when we have struggled for it mightily. And it has about it the flourishing of possibilities that is the signature of being, of the real, of the holy, of the Lord God. Small wonder that great moments of insight have been deemed to be inspirations, the gracious gift of muses. Small wonder that an oh, I see it moment transforms. And small wonder that it connects us to God. Every act of coming to know, Loder thus argues, prototypes knowing God. The logic of transformation is the grammar of the Holy Spirit, he says, that which he sovereignly deigns to co-opt to effect a powerful existential experience of the presence of God. The Christ event, as Loder calls convictional knowing, and that's what that, his book is about, Think here of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Once the Christ event is experienced, it spills over to link every ordinary act of knowing to itself. All knowing, once, anticipative, once anticipatively knowing God, becomes actually knowing God. The transformed knower becomes a transformer, semper transformanda, thus all-knowing, I believe, merits Simone Weil's powerful descriptor. It is a form of the implicit love of God. I therefore commend to you that knowing is perichoretically rhythmical, variably interpersonal, dynamically subsidiary focal integrative, covenantally constituted, historied, unfolding relationship of knower and known, that is mutually transformative, that is creaturely knowing, and ever a form of the implicit love of God. Having been known by and knowing Christ is the epistemic paradigm for all human knowing. And uh, just before I leave this section, I want to just alert you to a couple just juicy quotes. I, I didn't even write this into text because I thought about this this morning. Parker Palmer, in To Know As We Are Known, he's a, kind of an educational guru, says, truth is troth. Okay, truth is uh, derived from the word troth. So if you think of truth in the context of covenant faithfulness, right? Truth is troth. And then uh, this comment, uh, my colleague Bob Fraser kind of adapted from Abraham Joshua Heschel. So really the credit goes, I guess, to Bob. He says, the Greeks learn in order to comprehend. The Hebrews learn in order to be apprehended. Isn't that a killer? I just love that. I've got chills just standing here saying that. Okay, next section, inviting the real epistemological etiquette. And I'm a couple pages from the end. How then shall we know? What does this look like and how do we go about it? We are to invite the real. We are not at our best as knowers if we see ourselves as passively gathering information or actively demanding it. Nor can the reality we desire to know be itself when we treat it in these ways. You can think here of all those magical horse whisperer stories. Think how the movie portrays the first encounter of Seabiscuit with Red Pollard, his jockey. That was communion. It contrasts powerfully with all the other treatment that horse and boy had hitherto received. One may ask, who knew Seabiscuit truly? The abuse of trainers or Red? One may go on to ask, who healed? Who became what they truly were? 
as a result of the knowing. Did not both sea biscuit and red heal in that mutual knowing? Is this not what the cultural mandate calls us to be and do? We must practice what I call epistemological etiquette. There are ways we ought to behave to invite the real's gracious self-disclosure. You see, it's always, it's not out of our, it's not in our control for reality to come. It, it, so we invite it, we invite it, hence the etiquette. In contours, I have grouped several such practices under the general headings of desire, composure, comportment, and strategy. Early on, I thought that this chapter would be the book inviting the real. It is certainly my favorite chapter. Here I can tell you briefly about just one practice, although I feel that my list is in no way exhaustive or prohibitive of your own personal list once you get the hang of covenant epistemology. This one, I draw from the work of the personalists we have discussed. Martin Buber speaks of saying you and listening. When we approach the yet undiscovered reality that we long to know, covenant epistemology recommends that we come to it with the care we accord a person and that we treat it personally. We are to say you and then we are to listen. To say you is to voice a gentle, covenantal invitation to dance, or perhaps something more preliminary to ask, as Newbigin says, is anyone there? And then it is to wait patiently in silence for a gracious response. To say you in Buber's terms is to invite personal encounter. To do that, we ourselves must be the I of I you, all inauthenticity, not to mention insincerity, must be checked at the door. When do we do this? You can think of any number of examples in interpersonal relationships, from inviting a child to play, to a doctor's examination of a patient, from pedagogy to marital intimacy. And then there is worship. Should we not construe the assemblies calling God to worship at the outset of the meeting as the ultimate saying you and listening? Or the consecration of the Eucharist? Do we perhaps need to be reminded that we want God to show up? But, we may, not, but may we not also see that we do something like this with all dimensions of reality that we explore? I am currently trying to grow in my ability to work Sudoku puzzles. For the last half year, I have had my eyes painfully wide open, trying to attend to far more than I at first saw. In my groping attending over long periods of time, I feel I am knocking patiently, gently on a door, asking, it, asking for it to open. Would the efforts of cancer researchers compare favorably to this? I feel that Jesus modeled saying you and listening. That simple, humble, and I'd like to add subversive, will you give me a drink, was his saying you and listening. Jesus, the son of man, spoke authentically and humbly from his need. He evoked the woman's you, which to date had been well nigh erased. There's some kinship between the woman and Seabiscuit. She did not run excitedly to coax her antagonist to come and see Jesus because he named her sins. Rather, she ran because when he named her sins, it was in the rich interpersonal context of having said you and listening. Contemplate here the dearness of God saying you and listening for us. Reality is in no way obligated to self-disclose. It often does self-disclose graciously and lavishly. It self-discloses with its signature fullness of being, lavishing us with far more than we could ever have asked or imagined. And in that way, so very like its creator who gives it. What is more, we can be blessed with that wondrous phenomenon I call surprising recognition. We may say, as Buber quotes Goethe saying to the rose bush, so it is you, we can have a sense of recognition. With Jacob, we may say, surely the Lord was in this place and I was not aware of it. 
Mike Williams reasons with his students and readers. He says, what is the direction of the motion of scripture? Is it ascent, people climbing to God? No, it is always ever descent, the descent of God. God comes to his people. Williams talks about Jacob's ladder, the very dream that prompted this exclamation. We are not climbing Jacob's ladder. God is descending it graciously. His reality, himself, and bravely, bravely, bravely breaks in and transforms us. And it is our humble privilege to live with that delightfully desperate anticipation, the longing that makes us human in even our most ordinary acts of coming to know. Uh, short objection and reply before I conclude. What about collecting data? Saying you and listening is one of an array of things I believe we do sincerely to invite the real. It shows how inviting the real involves the gentle presumption that both knower and known are persons in interpersonal relationship. In closing, I want to entertain and address briefly one question that I can just bet many of you are asking. What about collecting data? Saying you and listening seems rather childish in contrast to collecting hard data. I hope you already see that the question itself very likely reflects a defective epistemic default, knowledge as information, factoids, data. It is a telling phrase. We utter collecting data as if the last word has been said as far as scientific knowledge, the only kind of knowledge that is really knowledge, is concerned. What has been going on is that in the name of certainty, we have downgraded what can't be put into words and quantified to a subpar epistemic status or no epistemic status. The trick is that, a little like an iceberg, whatever is visible and articulable and quantifiable is supported by, outrun by, accredited by, made sense of by, rendered useful by the inarticulable, the subsidiary, the covenantal, the interpersonal. And if perchance it isn't so supported, data dies on the vine. We have been guilty of ignoring the epistemic elephant in the room, to draw on yet another picture. My conviction, and also Michael Polanyi's, is that accrediting the tacit coefficient, as he called it, is the only way both to great science and to any science. Covenant epistemology intends not to replace collecting data, but to context it and transform it for its health and effectiveness, as well as our own and the world's. I hope that in this talk I have helped you identify a defective default common to knowers that operates damagingly everywhere where knowers aspire to know. I have proposed a fresh paradigm for knowing the interpersonal covenantal relationship I hope that my sketch of it not only describes it, but also shows its viability. In particular, I hope we see how we may live out knowing that takes its formative shaping from knowing and being known by God. And finally, I hope that all this has drawn you more deeply into loving and knowing him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Meek. That was um, really wonderful, <clears throat> very thought-provoking. Ordinarily, the moderator at the end of this asked the first question. However, one thing I learned over the three or four years, Kevin, that you moderated these sessions was that among the many other talents you have, you ask the best first questions of anybody I have ever met. Consequently, may I ask you a favor? Would you mind asking the first question? <laughs> you seem to break the ice and open up a flood of questions from others better than anybody. I think it's a God-given talent. I really do. It's a spiritual gift. 
the spiritual gift of the first question. I hate to put you on the spot. Would you be willing to do that? Of course. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Kevin. <laughs> Good to see you. Nice to see how your thinking has grown as you've confronted reality over the years. Um, a couple of, well, a name to suggest and then a question to oblige Steve. Um, the name is another personalist. I'm not sure you've come across yet, but I see ways in which he would help your case mm -hmm. and then add a little ethnic variety as well. Uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, come across oh. him. But yeah, I saw him referenced in um, your work. It's quite possible. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he, was, he yeah. would uh, give you some ammunition in the say, you, and listen section, yeah. since he's all about dialogue, which is a, and it's a, dialogue is his way of thinking about knowledge, I think. Uh-huh. It's a. You said, you cited him about a genre being a speech act. Yes. Okay. Uh, but my question here are for those of us who may still be uh, interested in factoids, especially when it comes to reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. So I, I, what I want to know is, have you thought this through with regard to biblical hermeneutics? Uh, you mentioned Sudoku, you mentioned crossword puzzles. What about the biblical text, mm -hmm. those marks on the page? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the implications of what you're saying for how we read the Bible and do exegesis, pastors and mm -hmm. students alike? Well, I haven't thought this through completely, but one thing that seems evident to me working from a Polanian approach is what you're supposed to do with Scripture is indwell it. I mean, that's the whole point of memorizing Bible verses. So you, re you read, you know, you memorize Psalm 23, and then your mother died. And then you are, it's like, it, like there's been times in my life that I, I just wanted to try to insert myself into the Bible, like crawl into the page. And I see that as climbing into the words of the authoritative guide, which you've got to do to figure out from the inside what it looks like. And so the you know, I, I have written on uh, the role of authoritative guides in knowing, picking up on frames, normative, uh, and, and I think all knowing requires authoritative guides. Um, and, and what we do with our authoritative guides, which are all over the place, I mean, just think about coaches. My colleague's son is a diver. He should have gotten first in states last week, but his coach's mother died the day before the event, and the coach was not present, and he, he flubbed his dives. He had nobody there to speak authoritatively into his own body, what he's doing in his own body. And so whatever else is going on in Scripture, just like we try to climb into our coach's words, we climb into those world, words and let them shape even our bodies. You know, the, if you want to have like a surefire proof of the existence of God, it's called obedience, right? And obedience is lived truth. So that's one thing that I've thought. I'm sure there's lots more things to, to, to think. But The indwelling, I think, is obviously on the right track. I think we need to do a lot more engaging the imagination as well as the mind and so on. But uh, what happens when others who indwell the text in different churches, seminaries, disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, how in general does your approach handle epistemic disagreement? Yeah, um, I handle it this way, and this, is, this goes back to my work in Polanyi. When you uh, work from subsidiary clues to a focal pattern, for one thing, the subsidiary clo clues are bigger, there's more of them than you can even name, let alone articulate uh, in the act of relying on them. But then, what he says, what his lingo is, and it, and it was in my um, text today, you, you come to this focal pattern and you submit to it as a token of reality. So, you know the blind man and the elephant? Okay, so the, the, the one blind man gets hold of his tail and thinks that an elephant's like a snake, and one gets hold of his leg and thinks he's like a tree. Well, the point isn't postmodern relativism. 
The point is we've got to talk to each other that we, what we lay hold on is a piece of reality. And you can have a piece and not know yet what piece it is that you have. So I always say, you know, we say Columbus discovered America. <laughs> Well, guess what? He didn't think that's what he discovered. You notice he knew he was onto something big, but it wasn't necessarily America. So the fa if we've made contact with reality, we've laid hold to an aspect on it. Uh, the, to cut to the chase here, God's reality is so rich that it can take us years to figure out what it was that we got hold of. That calls for epistemic humility. And given the whole uh, fact that God is Lord, um, even somebody consistently rebelling against God can't help but come up with some true stuff. And so can't help but get a piece of it right. I mean, if you're sitting here, you're getting a piece of it right. You know, you've survived through this many years without killing yourself, right? So you've gotten some things right. And so uh, I think that we need to be able to live graciously with that epistemic dissonance. And I believe that we also can do that with scripture as we would with, with anything. Does that help? Okay. Someone else? Right here? Um, I appreciate you talk about the de descent of God and uh, the, the contour of epistemology, but um, I wonder if you would put in um, the kind of God's hiddenness or God's silence in your contour to signal the valley of our understanding of God. Um, and I, I wonder where would it be and how would it be like uh, if you try to picture how God uh, being silenced from uh, human beings uh, in his communicative act, um, or um, something like how he hides from us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I, I'm not getting all of your words, but the question's about the, si the apparent perceived silence of God. The fact that we don't see his face a lot of, a lot of times. And I, I guess I've got to speak uh, kind of from my experience. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm going to kind of ask a different question and respond to it. A lot of people have said to me, I think it's related, well, so, you know, how can you be against certainty when the Bible says, you know, faith is certainty, Hebrews 11, 1, uh, whatever, however that goes in the NIV, but uh, sees it as certainty. Can't we take faith as certainty? And I usually come back and say, okay, let's go down to Hebrews 11, eight maybe, where it says, by faith Abraham went out not knowing where he went. <laughs> so I, I know when, when I was undergoing some uh, huge darkness, I had a sense that everything was black, but I had hold of his hand. And so even though I couldn't see him, I was groping to follow him. And I, I've learned that there's a, a way in which he meets me in darkness and pain in a way that makes no logical sense and isn't something that I could even, you know, rationally prove or, or anything like that. So one thing I would like to say is that sometimes in that silence, he is there. Um, and we can have a bit of him. And I, th I also think when you see knowing as covenantal, it is perfectly okay to resolve to believe something in the dark. Okay? And so you think of John the Baptist. I say this in longing to know. You know are you the one who was to come? Or should we look for someone else? That is the cry of someone who does not see the face of God. Having seen him incredibly early on in the, in the three years. And, and um, it, it's okay, I think, to believe in the darkness as, a, as an act of resolve and waiting. But that, in that way, it's no different from 
persistently pursuing a cure for cancer in the dark, in the not yet knowing what it's going to look like. And so that, those dynamics are the case about all acts of knowing. Am I getting at your question? All right. Wayne, you had a question? Thank you, Dr. Meek. I really appreciate what you had to say. Thank um, you for inviting me. It's oh. so much fun to be able to <laughs> share this with I'm glad you you know, could come. people other than outside my head. So. <laughs> glad you could come. Um, I want to ask a question, kind of um, acknowledging that we have people from who are both becoming uh, uh, very skeptical of all things on mm -hmm. one end, and then you have a, a, another group of, of either Christ Christians or people who are familiar with Christianity who are going through a kind of doubt crisis. Um, we're buying into this epistemology that you critiqued early on in your paper. You're basically saying, well, I can't have that kind of certitude regarding God, the resurrection, mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. What kind of uh, counsel do you give people that, are, that uh, kind of prod them towards that covenantal epistemology? Mm -hmm. Well, I always appeal to what we're always already doing. I mean... You, you cannot go through life being skeptical of everything. I mean, that was the why Marjorie Greene says that Descartes' cogito was the greatest falsehood of philosophy. You can't doubt everything at once. And um, so you have to rely on some things. I mean, he forgot his mother for crying out loud. She taught him language. You know what I'm saying? So his whole capacity as a person was personed. And um, he uh, blinded himself to that. In, in the pursuit of certainty. So even the most skeptical person has got to be trusting something. And so uh, sometimes our lived bodily epistemology is always going to be better than some of our inherited Western epistemology. And so let, you know, I want to say to people, you know, let's talk about riding a bike. Just talk about, just think about riding a bike. You know, what is certainty? Well, certainty is focal uh, attention to all the data of the bike riding. But you know what? If you do that, you're going to fall off the bike. Okay, so I'm a Steelers fan. So certainty is Ben Ro Roethlisberger standing on the 50-yard line holding the playbook. That's certainty. Who wants that? What you want is him to make a pass and win the game. Right? In other words, he lives the playbook creatively. Now, that isn't skepticism. It's not certainty. Certainty would have him frozen. Right? Oh, yeah, he's got to go memorize the playbook, or, you know, he's got to know all those details, da, 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 da. but then he's got to live them. He's got to live them. And we're always doing that. If a skeptic can ride a bike, his body's doing the right thing, or her body's doing the right thing. So go back to what they're doing right, and, and then kind of blow on the coals of that. Does that make any sense? So, I mean, but again, you can work this, uh, and in longing to know, the kind of the driving uh, analogy was that knowing God is like knowing your auto mechanic. Now the driving <laughs> uh, uh, thesis of contours is, kind of the converse, knowing your auto mechanic is like knowing God. But you can go either way, you know. So paying at attending to what we do successfully as knowers helps us understand knowing God, and attending to knowing God helps us be better knowers, is what I, I want to argue too. And here's the cool thing. I, I don't know if you're feeling this, but what I see is if we have this faith-reason dis divorce, so here's all the theological propositions, the doctrinal propositions, the proposition, the memorized Bible verses. And here's my relationship with Christ. If this is reason and knowledge, what the heck is this? But we know this matters because we love Jesus, right? It's just that we have not been allowed to go epistemic to see that this is what knowing ought to look like. And once we see that, then it cores all of our successful knowing. So that's, what, that's the way I get these back together, and that makes it, it's right that knowing God and being known by him is paradigmatic for all good knowing. I think that's cool. I just, I think that's actually awesome. <laughs> so. Uh, 
I, I take it your um, descriptor of covenantal epistemology is, um, you mean that paradigmatically too. Um, I gathered um, you're trying to foreground the relationality, communion, trust aspect uh, in the knowing and being known. Is there, is there any other thing that uh, um, emphasizing it as a covenantal epistemology that, that informs uh, your, that this view of epistemology that, that is important for the Christian to, to uh, uh, try to live out and, and uh, appropriate in practice? Restate your question slightly differently, just so I make sure I get it. Not the whole thing. I got the setup, but just say the sure. question. Uh, what, in what way does uh, the covenantal part of covenantal epistemology inform the uh, ought, how it, how should it how should it inform uh, a Christian's uh, walk mm. walking with the mm -hmm. Lord in, oh. in his general life? There are, I'm glad you asked that question, because I, as I was reading, I think, you know, I, I haven't said a whole lot to, to bless pastors, <laughs> as, as I certainly wanted to, but there's, you know, obviously knowing God, if you think that knowledge is information, and that your choices are theory and application, or, you know, knowledge, reason and faith, you know, that's going to make for a defective discipleship, and that was Newbigin's point in proper confidence, and you know, that, that you've got to get that knowing is, a, is this interpersonal thing, and then that unleashes you to, you know, lose yourself in the, in, the, in the relationship with God. And then the idea of knowing and being known, and, and the idea of, of the gracious descent of God, the descent of God, I think all of those are very cool, just to our delight in the Lord, which should be central to our worship and to our congregation and all of that. Uh, if you think of uh, any sort of discipling, person-to-person -person discipling, same dynamics are going to be enhanced by cultivating relationship and seeing relationality as the kind of the main act, that this uh, perichoretic relational particularity, uh, that kind of... Uh, Thing. One thing it disposes us to is patience. So you think of, you know, I can think of uh, students of mine, <laughs> you know, and I'm sure you can think of people in the congregation that have a long way to go, <laughs> you know, but over the years, you know, you, you keep nurturing, you know, so you're, you're covenanted to patience and perseverance in, in that sort of a relationship. Another thing that I haven't even talked about this time, and I don't quite know how to get to it, uh, given how I've said it, but given that I think that that knowing is from the body up, uh, one thing that I wonder about is how pastors may so speak that the word transformed down to the toes. I think if we separate mind and body, then it's hard for people, especially in this culture, to see how redempt, how to not see, but feel redeemed in their body. How do you make somebody feel redeemed in their body? Well, my pastor gave an incredible, uh, 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 did, did this successfully, I felt, uh, and I'll just tell you his story because I think it was incredible. He was fencing the table. And uh, he uh, told the story of uh, author Toni Morrison, who uh, was asked what seminar made her, you know, a Pulitzer Prize winning author. And she smiled and said, oh, no seminar. I'm going to cry. <laughs> she said, it was that when I was a child, every time I went into a room where my father is, his face lit up. And then my pastor said, come to the table and bask in the gaze of your heavenly father. I mean, I, I was just like, I'm, I cry at communion all the time. I mean, I just, it's, so, it's so intimate and so I can so see and feel the presence of God. But that, I mean, I was 
I was done for this very nice man sitting next to me said, well, you know, after the benediction, he said, I'm sorry about your cold. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Whoa! No, but do you see, his words didn't just report or, uh, uh, you know, announce. They made my body feel it. And I felt redeemed to my toes. So a, a holistic understanding of knowing allows us to employ the gospel in all its evocative nuances as it was meant to be. So I hope that speaks to that too. Thank you, Dr. Meek, for your talk. That was very thought-provoking. Uh, I'd like to return to the question up front regarding certainty in your illustration of Ben Roethlisberger and the Steelers. Uh, as you know, the Steelers don't win the Super Bowl every year. Uh, and in fact, I think Roethlisberger did fall off his motorcycle without a helmet. So what I'm, I'm, I'm wondering the relationship of certainty to your covenant epistemology. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there room for false belief to be uh, assured as certain within your framework? Um, is it possible for the covenant experience to blind reality? Uh, and if so, how do you account for warrant or justification in your system? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know the term fallibilism. Well, I, I think that integrations are so rich um, and reality is so rich that we generally get a piece of it, not the whole. And that means learning is going to be entertaining for eternity. You know, it's just we'll, we'll, never, we'll never get it exhaustively because it isn't, there isn't an exhaustive to get. That's one of the things I continually say to my students. It's about communion. It's not about unbridled lucidity, to use Polanyi's phrase. If I know, let's say you're my son, and I know you intimately, I will never know you exhaustively. That would even be no fun. You wouldn't like it. It wouldn't feel right to you. But communion, that's the goal. And, and there's, a, there's a, a better knowing in communion than there is in exhaustive certainty. It's better. So I may not be, you know, let's say you're my son. I know that, uh, you know, you have complete commitment to me as your mother. I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know what it's going to look like in the future. Indeterminate future manifestation. And that's what promise is about. And Williams always says, you know, they ain't predictions. They're promises. You know, Isaiah wrote Isaiah 53 he didn't know Jesus of Nazareth, but when you know Jesus of Nazareth, you can't not read him into Isaiah 53. So there's a sense in which when the eschaton happens, we, will, we can't comprehend what it'll be like. We can't anticipate it exhaustively. We can't predict it. But when it comes, we'll say, oh, how like God. This has God all over it. You know, it's, and now I can, looking back, now I can see but I couldn't, I couldn't have seen it looking forward. So, you know, now where does warrant and justification come in that? I think, like, kind of like what I said with data, it unleashes you to the, do the most intense and disciplined work of justification that you can. But, but it's with a reverence to the infinity of reality in God. It's, it's responsibility, it's not exhaustiveness. So, yes, you need to spend years in the lab to find a cure for cancer. And do it as precisely and exactly as you can. Just don't make the mistake of thinking that's all you're doing, or that's all there is to knowledge. I say, you've got to love a frog to dissect him. You know, you've got to be interested in frogs. You don't just, like, collect data. People that collect data have a passion. What we need to see is that's the passion that centers and cores what they do. Does that help? Thank you. 
Okay, uh, I just had a question on your uh, section on epistemological etiquette. Um, I was just wondering if your work on that, uh, have you developed uh, specific ideas of how we um, do this listening and the saying you and listening in a way that helps us become better attainers of truth? And um, particularly, do you find the idea of intellectual virtues to be helpful here mm -hmm. as a way to regulate our epistemic practices um, rather than kind of the focus on necessary and sufficient conditions for knowledge, mm -hmm. a more regulative epistemology approach? I, I uh, want to do a third alternative, I guess, to the two that you um, mentioned. I, I, it's great to be virtuous. And obviously, that's, co that's got covenantal about it. But it doesn't necessarily have the relational about it that I think is core. And so I want to go covenantal, not just on my, my etiquette, but on the saying you and listening, so the interrelational. What, one, I'm trying to think of all the different things I have in my, my uh, book, my uh, chapter on inviting the real. One I think of is listening beyond the categories. And I get this from David Dark's Everyday Apocalypse. Do um, you know that book? What is it? Uh, the, the Sacred in The Simpsons and Flannery O'Connor and Radiohead and, you know, oh, I mean, you, know, you can just like tell this guy's a high school English teacher. But um, it's, it's an awesome book, but he wants to say his God is revealing himself everywhere. You just have to find a way to listen. And you've got to listen beyond the categories. So every one of us, we, we, navigate life by forming concepts and, and making distinctions and all that sort of a thing. But I say concepts have a shelf life. And they can get kind of stale, and they can get in the way of our connecting with reality. So let's say I decide you're paranoid, schizophrenic. And then everything you say, I say, see that? Paranoid, schizophrenic. <laughs> you know, it's just like him, paranoid, schizophrenic. Does it not get in the way of my attending re to reality? So you do have, I think, in the Polanian approach, you have to uh, honor the fact that we have some kind of tacit connectedness that we are not able to articulate with the world. We're already in the world. We're connected with it. My mother uh, spent some years being senile before God um, took her. And my mother was the consummate wordmeister. And I just remember one time when I was talking to her in her senility, and she said, I feel, and I can't remember now what it was. Let's say she said, um, I feel sad. And then she said, I'm not sure that word is apt. Now think about the word apt. Apt is a word that describes fit of word to world. How, how do we ascertain whether a word is apt? That's got to take more than the words. And yet we do that all the time. We navigate the world through that kind of sensitivity to it. And it makes more sense to have a paradigm of interpersonal relationship. You know, we read each other, we attend to each other, we don't always get it right. <laughs> you know, I can read your face and say, you know what, paranoid schizophrenic, <laughs> or, or whatever, you know, and, and uh, miss it. So knowing is this, it's just way richer than data collection. Well, it is, it is our time. Thank you again very yeah, much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>couple of announcements and then I'll close in prayer. Okay. Wayne asked me to announce next year's scripture and ministry lectures will be and information will be sent out I presume Doug over the summer in sort of the same format and you can always it's henrycenter.org right is the I mean, it's, it's checked as one of my favorites so I'm <laughs> just go okay so it's on the website now the dates go ahead and uh, put those in the calendar but the speakers, again, like this year, are very exciting. They really are. Ravi Zacharias in the fall, Craig Carter, Richard Mao, Christine Pohl in the spring. So I'm sure you'll want to go ahead to the henrycenter.org website, uh, bookmark that as one of your favorites, and then uh, put those dates, enter those dates in your calendar so you won't miss those. Also, 
Dr. Meek's book, Longing to Know, is on sale at the bookstore currently. So please be sure to take advantage of that a wonderful opportunity as well. Thank you so much for coming. Let me close in prayer with thanksgiving to God for his grace on us this afternoon. Heavenly Father, we thank you that from eternity you are a God in relationship, in perichoresis. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons, one God, eternally so, indwelling, relating to, dancing with one another, overflowing with joy. And we thank you, God, that in Jesus Christ, through his sinless life, his death on the cross, and his glorious resurrection, you invite us to join the dance, overflowing with joy in your presence. We thank you that that is our prospect for all eternity as well. We thank you that Dr. Meek has brought our attention to some of these truths this afternoon. We ask your grace, Lord, on her continuing ministry. And we pray your blessing on each and every one who's been here this afternoon. Thanks be to you, God, for your glorious truth revealed to us in your word and in the face of Jesus Christ. We pray your grace on each one in the name of that same Jesus.